What Satan has done to the family is similar to the pool game I used to play. And you send that cue ball flying into that member of balls and they are fragmented all over the pool table. That is what Satan has done to the family today. If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. With a commanding voice, Satan bellows out, Families, I hate them. We must destroy them, for they are the foundation of society. They are the strength of the nations. They are the lifeblood of the churches. I want to talk this afternoon about the fragmented family. I call it independent atoms. What Satan has done to the family is similar to the pool game I used to play. Remember in pool, you rack up your balls, then you take a cue ball, and you take a cue stick, and you send that cue ball flying into that member of balls, and they are fragmented all over the pool table. That is what Satan has done to the family today. If a house be divided against it, itself, that house cannot stand. Mark 3, verse 25. I was back home visiting my mother in Appleton, Wisconsin, and uh, I had one of those chance meetings with one of my old friends, and his family was with him, and I had my family, and suddenly two men in their middle ages are staring at each other through eyes that used to know each other in their youth. And Jerry was standing there, and he was introducing his family to me, and I was introducing my family to him. He had two boys, I had two boys. And Jerry was standing there, and he was looking my boys up and down like this. He'd look over at his boys, and he'd look his boys up and down. His boys had mohawk haircuts, earrings in, pants that my wife calls the Great Divide. <laughs> Are you with me? And then he was looking at my boys. And then we began talking about the intervening decades that had gone on. Suddenly, Jerry looked at me, he says, Jim, Let's go for a walk. As we started walking, Jerry looked at me and says, Jim, what has happened? He says, when I looked at your boys and I looked at my boys and I thought about all our buddies from our high school days, he says, I see your boys as happy, directed, and they look so, so, and he, he was searching for an adjective and he said, so innocent. He says, well, all of us have lost our boys. What has happened, he said. I assured Jerry that what had happened to him and other buddies was no accident, but it was rather the outcome of a cleverly devised master plan. And I will now share with you in a short dissertation what I shared with Jerry over two hours of conversation. I told Jerry it happened somewhere around 1945, at the end of World War II. It was in a beautiful grove of trees where the hillside formed a natural amphitheater. The commander-in-chief steps forward and addresses his followers. With a commanding voice, Satan bellows out, Families, I hate them. We must destroy them, for they are the foundation of society. They are the strength of the nations. They are the lifeblood of the churches. They have endured our wars, our famines, and our holocaust. Amid all our upheavals, they continue to function. We must change this. Whosoever gains the family, gains the world. And then he laid out his plan to his imps. He said, separate the members into so many different parts that they resemble independent atoms. To accomplish this will require all our craftiness and the patience to wait decades for the results. But in the end, it will be worth it. Yes, we shall infiltrate the family, but how, shouts out his imps. First, bring them prosperity. Never has the church or the family or society done well under its influence. Babylon fell under prosperity. Medo-Persia fell under prosperity. Rome fell under prosperity. David and Solomon fell under prosperity, he says, and the United States is going to go down under prosperity as well. We have placed a heavy emphasis on education, and gradually over the years, we'll corrupt their institutions, their professors, and their teachers. Then remember how we destroyed the children of Israel at the borders of the Promised Land? We'll use entertainment to open the way to infidelity. 
We shall bring television into every home and over decades alter their perceptions ever so slowly and entirely. We'll also do this with billboards, radio, music, magazines. Gradually, we'll work the essential into them all because by beholding, they all become changed, changed into our image. Best of all, it will be so slow and deliberate they'll never know it. Satan continues, time. We must invent every scheme possible to consume their time. It matters not whether they are doing good things or bad things. Just so long as we keep them busy, 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 being under Satan's yoke. Their families will suffer and the process of fragmentation will be automatic. One of Satan's general stands. Give us a timeline. Now, uh, brothers and sisters, I pray as I go through the decades with you, starting in the 50s, that you will follow with me and the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart if the devil has infiltrated your life, your marriage, and your family. The decade of the 1950s. This generation fought and won the war. Now they want to experience getting on with life. Let them succeed and prosper. Get them to move to bigger and better homes in the suburbs. The women work during the war in large numbers. Keep them willing to work at least part-time and as many as possible full-time. Every moment stolen from the family is a victory for us and encourages others in our way. This generation is tired. They want something better. This will set the stage for the next generation of the 60s. In the 60s, to excel will now require longer hours and harder work. A second car will be needed for transportation. Do you remember those days? I can remember in my neighborhood, nobody had a second car. When someone bought a second car, that was big news. Before I moved to Montana, I had five. The men will need to take trips away from home as part of their jobs. As Eve was vulnerable when she left her partner's side, so will these men and women. Divorce will slowly be commonplace, leaving their homes easy prey for our destroying influences. If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. In their rush to make up for lost time, this generation will acquire something their parents shunned, debt and more debt. This will give birth to the modern two-income family. This will be the first generation to leave home to maintain a lifestyle rather than life itself. The weaker the families, the weaker families will now start to crumble the first fruits of our plan. Friends, this happened right before my eyes in my own neighborhood in Ramblin' Court, Wisconsin, Appleton, Wisconsin. I didn't understand what was going on. But as I look back through right now, I can see the very families that were crumbling. I can picture their faces. I know their names. In the 70s, we'll usher in scientific discoveries, opening new avenues to occupy their minds and speed up their pace. Yes, computers. Computers will do it, a glut of information. Then we'll introduce birth control. It will so dramatically alter their morality, they will never recover from the effects. In the previous decades, we started to alter their music by ushering in the happy days of what? Rock and roll. This will have so captivated the youth that for the first time, music will now become a wedge of division between the generations. And if we are careful, we can use it to degrade them into mere puppets of base passion and evil. And television is the great enemy. He says, yes, the golden age of television. That was innocent in the 1960s, like Lassie. Do you remember Lassie? Leave it to Beaver, Dale Evans, and Roy Rogers. Like the Pied Piper, we shall lead them down the path to destruction. Few, if any, will comprehend the slow process of gradual corruption in the TV set. I can see the TV programs even before my eyes as I talk to you, the slow 
corruption that went on. The seeds we have planted will gain us millions while being blissfully unaware. We will now begin to reap a harvest from our efforts. The young people having grown up without the privation of their parents will now begin to discard their parents' belief system and seek meaning in sensuous lifestyles, music, drugs, communes, free love, free spirits will become the norm in this generation. Women will now flood the workplace. Daycare will begin to proliferate. Children will leave their parents' side earlier and earlier. They will grow up in front of the television set. Divorce will become rampant and will be seen as just another acceptable option. Logically, thousands will begin to question what difference does a little piece of paper make and will be living together without the benefit of matrimony. Satan now instructs his demons. I want you to put forth extreme efforts to ensure that nothing remains taboo or off limits. Horrific, horrific crime, drug use, immorality, evil of every kind, gay lifestyles, perversion of every nature can be explored, desensitizing their minds and numbing their consciences. Encourage every group to rise up and demand their rights. Let the courts allow abortion as a woman's right. Tempt the highest leaders in the land to break the law, then lie to cover it up. Bring it before the people in hideous detail so that their, so that their trust in public officials is shattered. This will create chaos because the old standards are now set aside, leaving them adrift on the tide of cultural change and social activism. Destroy the family supper hour, for here they communicate, have camaraderie, and get encouraged. It is a source of strength, planning, and unity. We must bring in discontent with meal planning and a simple fare. I can remember growing up, or should I say, I cannot remember growing up never having ate with my family. Every night you found my family together. All five siblings and our parents every night at the supper hour discussing the day, laughing, crying, sharing. Lure them away from their supper tables with fast foods, enticing foods, burgers, pizza, ice cream, and all the dainties. This will also destroy their health and add to their sorrows and perplexities. Fill them up and fill them out. Flood the corners of every town with McDonald's and Hardee's, Burger Kings, Dairy Queens, Baskin Robbins, Pizza Huts, Taco Times, and Sizzlers. Soon the family supper hour will become a thing of the past. I was raised in a town of 50,000 people, and in my town there was two drive-ins when I grew up. There was Mary's A&W on the south end, and there was Dag's on the north end. Recently, when I was home, I looked through the yellow pages. Would you care to guess how many places you can go out and eat now? Pages and pages and pages. It seems like nobody eats at home anymore. Enter the 1980s. The people will now be so degraded, they will enter the fourth decade of the 80s completely unaware of the depths to which they have been taken. The upheaval will unsettle not only families, but churches, society, and the nation. We must move wisely now, or they could become aware of their danger and seek to return to God. Now bring hard times upon them. This will confuse and distract, as well as encourage both parents to work, thus further stressing the family. Now saturate every television program, every advertisement, magazine, and billboards with images of the human form. Once appetites for such are created, it requires little effort to turn every grocery store, convenience store, and gas station into an outlet for the base and the sensual. Are you getting tired of it? 
Are you getting tired of it? I am. Violence and crime will now increase and will display it on the nightly news and newspapers, magazines, and our special rag sheets. Keep everyone, and I mean everyone, increasingly stressed and hassled with, with one temporary problem after another temporary problem after another temporary problem with no time to think, reflect, or turn to their God. Now, not only the weak marriages will fail, but apparently the strong ones will begin to fail as well. Remarriages will become so common that blended families will be yet another stress, further eroding the once strong family unit that before we were not able to destroy. Next, lay the groundwork for a new worldwide computer system computer system that will rev up their lives into a treadmill pace. I had one man come to me in a meeting. He says, Brother Holmberger, I'm not on a treadmill. I'm on two treadmills, and they're going two different speeds. <laughs> Is that you? Now we must destroy their Saturdays and Sundays. Make Saturday just another work day. Sunday, yes, Sunday. Turn it into a day of armchair sports. Bombard them with football and baseball, basketball and hockey. Yes, create a taste for that which is false and artificial, violent and brutal. This will turn their minds from the life's true purpose. I'm sick, gentlemen, when I think of all the hours and days and weeks I spent before a television set watching the Green Bay Packers beat up the Chicago Bears while my wife was left unattended and I ignored my two boys. Shame on me. This will set the stage for the fifth decade of our master plan. Look how successful we will be. Enter the 1990s. It's hardly been half a century in his master plan, and the majority will have acquiesced to their circumstances. Like a Trojan horse, we have infiltrated them from within. Hassled and hurried, they will adapt to our creeping compromise, never objecting and only complying. Now is the time to increase the pace, speed up the treadmill, have them go even faster. Let's push them over the edge. While here at Grants Pass, I got a phone call from Florida, and the man says, I read your first book. I got off my three treadmills. I'm down to one three treadmills, and he thought he was doing good being down on one. The birth of the internet will be seen as a blessing. Now they'll have countless letters, messages, and emails, emails, and emails. Give them call waiting so that when they have been interrupted, their interruption can have yet another interruption. <laughs> Ludicrous, isn't it? Couples will be so overwhelmed that they will become little more than ships passing in the night. Their children will feel like orphans in their own homes. Left to feed for themselves, they'll become peer dependent, TV dependent, computer dependent, and video dependent. All because mom and dad are busy, busy, busy being under Satan's yoke. Ah, the new millennium, the year 2000. By the sixth decade, the family, once the bedrock of society, will crumble and disintegrate. And brothers and sisters, it has. It has. The confused young people of the 60s will have raised an even more confused generation of cynical and disillusioned children in an almost disconnected state from their parents. And they are. And I want to cry. I want to I take them home and raise them all. Now these children have no one to guide them through their problems. Thus we can easily entice them to watch movies that aren't fit to be shown in hell and play video games designed by our most inventive devils. His demon sits spellbound as the gruesome plot continues to unfold before their eyes. 
What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Have you lived through it? Do you see with new eyes? Because their parents have murdered millions upon millions of their peers before they were even born in a slaughter so great in magnitude that it will make the Nazi death camps look merciful. Welcome to abortion. Now these children will rise up and kill their own classmates and parents. Baffled, society will wonder why these children have no respect for human life. You see, without a moral compass, things once shunned become not only tolerated, but they become mainstreamed. Society will have degraded so far that now even the President of the United States of America will engage in the most disgusting of affairs while ele elevating public lying to a new art form. Welcome to our generation. Satan pauses to quiz his followers. You get the picture, don't you? And they nod vigorously in approval. It will work. Then I shall continue, he said. Entertainment will reach its zenith with overwhelming choices and options. News 24 hours a day through any medium. Videos of every movie on every and any subject with nothing off limits or forbidden. With the internet, we can, for the first time, even now corrupt, corrupt them while they're at their school and at their workplace. May God have mercy on us. Enter the year 2010. By the seventh decade, there is little we need to do but enjoy the specter and anticipate the harvest. If we have done our jobs well, and brothers and sisters, they get an A plus, don't they? They have done their jobs well. The family will have been destroyed, and we shall exercise total control over the bedlam that remains. Victory is achievable in just 70 years. A timid hand is suddenly raised at the back of the crowd. Almighty leader, the humans assigned to me won't fall for these traps. You see, I have the really religious ones. Don't worry about them. They're no trouble at all, just as gullible as the rest. I have something special in mind for them. We will use their churches against them. Just get the church members too busy with good works, too busy with evangelism, too busy with pastoral duties, too busy with outreach, too busy with theological controversy, too busy with social activism. Just make sure that every moment is jam-packed. Make sure they have no time for introspection, quiet contemplation, or worse yet, communion with their God. And so, my friends, go forth with your legions to the victory, for they will soon be ours. I looked at my friend Jerry, spellbound, he was shaking his head, and he said to me, Jim, what am I to do? What is God's Spirit saying to you? Are there things you need to change in order to resist the devil's attack? My wife and I saw this 21 years ago, and we took the changes that were necessary to protect our two little boys. And those boys are men today, 27 and 25, and they've married godly, virtuous young girls, and they're standing today, brothers and sisters, standing above the rest. What is God telling you to do? In my second book, Empowered Living, which I'm taking this from, there's four chapters in there that if you've followed will transform your home into a fortress so strong and mighty that the devil will not be able to defeat it. I do not recommend that you read this book. I recommend that you implement it, brothers and sisters. It goes beyond reading. It takes implementation. That is where the power lies. 
Let me tell you about a friend of mine that implemented these four principles that are found in Empowered Living. His name was Mark. I respect him and I admire him because before Mark was even born, the devil says, I'm going to put a noose around his neck and I'm going to destroy this man before he even knows what's going on. When Mark was born, his mother died at the age of eight. His father began to molest him repeatedly. He was sent to live with relatives, but a friend of the family picked up the pattern of molestation where the father left off. The father remarried, and now his family became a family of ten, blended together. Physical abuse continued, accompanied by emotional abuse on a daily level. No one cared for Mark. Bitter tears of rejection. He would go out the back door and just lay in the backyard crying, why is this happening to me? And as soon as Mark was able, he joined the, let's hear it, the Marines. You know Mark, don't you? Yeah. Smoking, selling marijuana, drugs, sex, everything that goes with joining the Marines and that lifestyle. After hearing his background of abuse and knowing the odds that he will follow in his father's footsteps, you'd be forgiven if you wouldn't want him as your father. But that's not the case. His family is close, tight. They're together. When I go home to Appleton, Wisconsin, I always drive the one and a half hour up to his home. As I drive up to his home, four friendly children come running out the front door and they greet me. They greet me. Rachel, 15, Jonathan, 13, Rebecca, 11, and Esther, 9. Uncle Jim, Uncle Jim, we got things to tell you. Come on in. We have a whole meal planned for you. And so I come into their house into this house of this man that the devil tried to destroy before he was even born. When I come into the house, they got a feast set out for me like a king. They know all my favorite foods. And yes, there's hash browns there too. Yeah. And I sit down, they put me at the head of the table, and they got a little placard made for me with my name on it. They got a little crown they put on me. And the back of the placard is one of my favorite Bible texts. He is able to save you. And all of a sudden, the children start talking to me. I haven't even talked to Mark or Maria hardly. I give them each a hug, and the children are saying, how's Matthew doing? That's my oldest boy. What's he up to? How's his business going? And then you ask about Andrew. How's it going with Andrew? And what's going on in the ministry? And as we eat this lovely food, I notice that I'm not even talking to the parents. For two hours, I've been questioned, interrogated, and talked to by these four lovely children. Finally, it's dark. Mark believes in family time, and every night he has family time with his children, and Mark says, it's family time. What shall we do for Uncle Jim? It's a loving term that they've given me. And Mark said, let's have a concert for him. They have a music ministry. They travel the United States playing their music, such as we heard here from his song. Lovely music, heavenly music. Yeah, beautiful music. All the children each play two instruments. So they bring me in, they set me on a special little chair, and they do a concert designed just for Jim Omberger with all my favorite songs in it. I sit there, and it's like I'm being elevated up into the seventh heaven to the throne of grace. To me, it's like angels singing out loud and playing their music. And I say, yes, this is a family. This is what God designed. And after they're finished playing their music, Mark says, time for a story. And I watch the children, some of them teenagers, all come around and sit by their father's feet. And the father tells them a story, and then he interprets the story for their life. 
and I'm looking at the children's faces, and the children are listening attentively, not disinterestedly. And I look at the oldest girl in her eyes. I can tell the love she has in her eyes towards her father. And she's 15 years old, not going the way of the others. Pretty soon he concludes the story. And he says, time for bed. All the children get up and they go down the hallway. And the mother goes and the father goes with the children. I'm thirsty. I go in the kitchen. And it's right next to the hallway. And I linger there. I'm not eavesdropping, but I'm lingering. <laughs> Drinking my water slowly. You don't want to chug a lug, do you? And I hear Mark tuck every one of his children in. I hear him kiss every child and tell them, I love you, starting with the 15-year-old, and then the 13, and then the 11, and then the 9. Before Mark comes out, he finds me in the living room, sitting by the fireplace with my feet up. I'm contemplating what I just saw. I have witnessed a miracle. I have witnessed the devil defeated, the devil destroyed. We sit there, and Mark comes in, he sits next to me quietly. He doesn't say a word. We sit there for maybe five or ten minutes just contemplating. And I said, Mark, you have such a sweet family. How did you do it? He says, Jim, I just implemented what you preach and you write. That's all there is to it. Mark looks at me, he says, time for bed. Mark goes off down the hallway. I'm staying in a little apartment above the garage, and I walk up to my little apartment. I go into the bed, and as I laid down, I said out loud, God bless you, Mark, for what you've let God do in this family, in this home. Mark made hard choices, but what, what precious fruit has been coming from those choices. You can read the whole story in the book Empowered Living. You can find out just what Mark was steeped into, and you can find out how he came out of the devil's master plan. If Mark can come out, everyone of us can come out, brothers and sisters. Every one of us can come out. I don't think about any of us have been raised to the degradation that he was. Mark House is not divided anymore. Yours doesn't need to be either, brothers and sisters. There is a better way. May you implement it, is my prayer.